Welcome to Advent 2020 at uh, Yakima Covenant Church. Our theme this year is Huga for the Holidays. Uh, Huga, Huga is a word will be an opportunity to define during Advent. It means a co cozy refuge at Christmas. The word I hope will become familiar with to you and help you bring closure to 2020 and settle into the Advent season. Allow us to nestle down and to welcome the coming of Christ and all that he brings. We've been living through a turbulent time, global pandemic that's threatening the health of millions, political views that have been severing and protests and demonstrations, a call for racial justice. A disconnect has happened between church community, whether you've been meeting in person or not, or just simply online and not being able to sing together. 2020 has seen moments of feeling anxious and frightened and overwhelmed. There's a need for healing, physically from the virus, emotionally from strained and severed relationships, spiritually from fatigue and doubt and fear. So I invite you to experience and prepare for Advent through Huga. Today we light the candle of hope, the candle of peace, and the pink candle, the candle of joy. This candle is also known as the Mary candle. Mary demonstrates for us the grace, humility, and the determination of the woman who carried the incarnate joy of the world, Christ Jesus. Mary reminds us that we too carry the same joy in our lives as we live in a world that lifts up the powerful over the lowly, the prideful over the humble, and the strong over the weak. As we light this candle of joy, we acknowledge how hard it is to feel joy this year. We acknowledge Mary as a teacher of how to carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. We acknowledge our shared incarnate joy of Christ within us as we continue our journey of Advent. Would you pray with us? Holy God, we thank you for the gift of joy that is found in Christ Jesus. Remind us of this incarnate joy within us as we enter into another week ahead. Amen. Amen. Angels we have heard on high Sweetly singing o'er the plains And the mountains in reply Echo back their joy Glory. 
glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace to men on whom his favor dwells. Amen. It's dark. The world lies in sin and error pining. The shadows are conspiring, but a light is coming. The Lord has been quiet for four centuries. The prophets are gone. There are no signs to see. It's silent. But let me tell you something, a voice is coming. The patriarchs are long dead. The judges were traded for a bunch of crowned heads. This monarchy, though consistently failed and misled, no system is working, but there's a new king coming. Man's dead in religion. Legalism reigns. Ceremonial acts which are just simply profane. The law is not working. But a new covenant is coming. The people are defiling. The rituals God is despising. Even the priests are compromising and the sin offerings, their worthless sacrificing. Oh, but get ready because a lamb is coming. The temple is a den of thieves. A brood of vipers are the Pharisees. Same too for the Sadducees. They don't even know there's a new high priest coming. The nations are suffering. Evil is chuckling. And the faithful are left wondering, does God even care? Oh, let me tell you something. Emmanuel is coming. God's people desire a glorious king. The world is yearning for eternity. A perfect sacrifice each soul desperately needs. It's a silent night, but hope is in sight. A most precious gift God is bestowing. The Bethlehem star begins glowing. Let the good news start growing. A baby is coming. Good morning, church. For today's scripture reading, we will be looking at the book of Luke, beginning in chapter 1, verses 26 to 33. Listen for the word of the Lord. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was gr greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
As we begin in worship today, I want to turn your thoughts, your hearts to the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, first chapter, verses 3 through 6. Paul writes, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us all in our troubles, so that when we comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance and the same sufferings that we suffer. In this season that's filled with hope in the midst of suffering, let's praise our God and Father, His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and ask that His Spirit would lead us as we worship Him today. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, O come, ye, O come, ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the king of angels. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him. O come, let us adore him Christ the Lord sing choirs of angels sing in exultation oh sing all ye citizens of heaven above adore him Christ the Lord Oh come let us adore him Oh come let us adore him Oh come let us adore Today, 
Lord, give us strength to live for you and glorify your name. Your name is a strong and mighty shower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nation sing it louder. Cause nothing has the power to save but your name. You wonderful counselor, Prince of Peace. strong and mighty tower your name is a shelter like no other your name let the nation sing it louder cause nothing has the power to save but your name it's a strong and mighty tower your shelter like no other your name let the nation sing it louder cause nothing has the power to say but your name your God with us Emmanuel God with us Emmanuel, yes, you are God with us, Emmanuel, and we adore your Welcome to Yakima Covenant Church. Uh, we're in Advent 2020. Our theme is Hugo for the Holidays. I hope you f have been feeling invited in to uh, feeling the warmth and coziness. Hugo means uh, comfort and contentment, kind of like just snuggling up to fire with good friends. Our theme this morning, we're looking at uh, two women who experienced Hugo. Even if you don't know much about the Bible, there's a good chance you know this story that was read by uh, Sylvia this morning. Angel Gabriel is sent by God to a young woman out of the way town of Judea, telling that, she, telling that she's favored one of God, and the Lord would be with her, and she would have a son and name him Jesus. Our gospel says the word came by an angel to Mary when Elizabeth was six months pregnant. To put this all into place in context, Elizabeth is a relative to Mary. Unlike Mary, she's a very old woman, childless woman, Elizabeth had uh, the angel Gabriel come and tell her, though advanced in age, she and her husband would have a baby. Be John the Baptist, a future preacher, spreading the good news about this Messiah coming. While the focus of Mary is it's on Mary, a young woman called by God, it's interesting that older adults, Elizabeth, appears in the gospel. While older adults are fewer in the gospels, and we know it's true that they don't reach an old age, but Elderly are, are a key part in the first gospel story. The elderly are that major actor in the opening of the Luke. Uh, you can't get to the babe in Bethlehem without being led there by old people. A priest, Zechariah, oh, his wife, uh, Elizabeth, childless older couple who, it says in verse 7, were very old. Angel Gabriel appears to Elizabeth and to, she's going to bear a son. That bumps her from the geriatric ward to the maternity ward. And wonder of wonders, Elizabeth gives birth, even though old, and she is filled with the Holy Spirit, verse 41. Even in old age, God calls this woman to faithful service. Christmas is coming. We're looking forward to it. We're eager to be done with Advent and all the waiting, the preparations, and get to the full celebration of the birth. But Luke insists 
Before you get to the miraculous, wondrous birth, you must first meet a very old woman, Elizabeth, and a very young woman, Mary, and hear their maternity stories. I remember hearing a sermon and began, what would you say if a man came up wearing a white robe and told you you're going to have a baby, and that man was not your gynecologist? Well, that's how Luke's story begins in the birth of Christ. Luke doesn't begin with Christ, it begins with two women. These two women, it's important to see, they were in the Near Eastern culture or first century, and that means they were on the margins and with, without many rights. They were utterly powerless and vulnerable position in societies in general. Elizabeth had no children, and back then, children were a blessing from God. You were given more prestige and honor if you had children. Also, no children meant no security in their old age. The children were equivalent to the social security system in the Near East. Other woman, Mary, also marginalized, vulnerable because she was poor, young, and not married. Gabriel appears to both women, and God's messenger announced in different ways, but basically rejoice, God will favor you with a baby. Elizabeth says, some embarrassment, a woman her age, uncomfortable in maternity ward. Mary, also embarrassed, unmarried woman having a baby, also embarrassing, you say, in a maternity ward. How are you going to explain that? Yet Mary responds with the heavenly messenger and says, I don't know what it means, but I'm willing to trust God to bear this child and call it Jesus. God chose ordinary humans, Elizabeth, the spokesperson of God, and Mary to carry the Son of God. What's impossible for us is possible with God. The angel expresses that it's possible with God. Well, it's true with us as well. Paul, in writing to Corinth, uh, reflects upon a profound truth in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. It says, we have this treasure of clay and jars so that it may be made clear this extraordinary power belongs to God and not from us. God calls ordinary people, people like you and me, always been God's way. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians in uh, chapter 1, verse 26 and 28, says, consider your own call, brothers and sisters, not many of you are wise by human standards. Not many of you are powerful. Not many of you have noble birth. But God chose what was low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce to th nothing, things that are. Mary responds later in Luke 1, 46 through 56. I'm an ordinary person. It says, I am not perfect. We are imperfect people. It's important for us to get that. But the good news is, is God is not seeking perfection. God chooses the ordinary. God loves the unlovable. God reverses just about everything, expectation, and how the Lord has entered this world. Does God flatter the proud? No, God scatters the proud. Does God seek to invite them to the, from the throne? No, God brings the throne down and lifts up the lowly. Does God hang out in the finest of restaurants? No, God throws a banquet for the poor. Does God choose a queen or a princess to be the mother of Jesus? No, God chooses Mary. Does God choose wise, noble, powerful world to bring his divine will? No, God chooses you and me. Does God love the lovable? Yes. And God loves the unlovable. God forgives the imperfect and God reaches out to the lost. Christmas is really about this attribute of God. God displays Huga, God who loves us, God who reaches out and down to us, God who stoops down to our work weakness. As Charles Wesley wrote in that hymn, mild he lays his glory by. Hark the herald angels sing. That's Huga. That is being accepted and wealth and well, or warmth and welcome. I see, God comes in the unspectacular, humble form when God came among us and when God acted decisively to reach out to us, he laid his status aside to sit at the table. Hugo, comfortable friend. When God came among us as Jesus Christ, God came to two people on the margins, far away from the centers of power. The story of our redemption begins by God bypassing the centers of power, ignoring the big and influential men like King Herod and Caesar Augustus. The story begins with two women, elderly Elizabeth in pain, childless, no progeny or hope. And then Gabriel shows up, and Elizabeth realizes she has a future that's up with God, and graciously giving her a future, not something she earns herself, but grace. 
cousin Mary is powerless. No special attributes. Uh, Luke identifies her experiences. She's unmarried. No one to protect her. No real identity. No position in society. And Gabriel shows up and Mary realizes she is somebody blessed, fortunate, and she's given a job to do to bring the salvation of the world to us. What, what a way to open the drama of salvation in Jesus Christ. What, what a grand prelude to the birth of Jesus. Elizabeth and Mary are interesting characters, but the central character in this whole drama is the God of Israel delighting in calling older adult and unwed young woman often relegated to the margins. I hope you will hear the story of God coming to these two women, one young and the other old, unknown and lowly on the margins as your story. Let's face it, most of us are unknown in this world. We're not given a power to rule, and few of us have prestige or privilege. Luke's gospel says, rejoice, you're the sort of person God enlists to play a part. God's great reclamation, God's redemption project. John Egan died in 1987. He was an ordinary man, unheralded high school teacher, 30 years of ministering to youth. Never wrote a book, or appeared on television, converted the masses, or gathered a reputation of holiness. He ate, slept, drank, biked across country, roamed the woods, taught classes and prayed, and kept a journal that was published soon after he died. It's a story of an ordinary man who's Soul was seduced by the, and ravished by Jesus Christ. The book's intro reads, the point of John's journal is that we ourselves are greatest obstacle to our own nobility of soul, which is what sanctity means. We judge ourselves unworthy servants, and that judgment becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. We deem ourselves too inconsiderable, be even used even by a God capable of doing miracles with no more than mud or spit, and thus our false humility shackles an otherwise omnipotent God. Egan, flawed man, salient in weaknesses, character defects, learned that brokenness is the proper to human condition that we must forgive ourselves for being unlovable, inconsistent, incompetent, irritable, and pot-bellied. He knew his sins, could not keep him from God, all been redeemed by the blood of Christ, and in his repentance he dared to live as a forgiven man. His journal, he wrote this, the basis of my personal worth is not my possessions, my talents, not self-esteem of others or reputation, not kudos of appreciation from parents or kids, not applause, and everyone telling me how important I am to the place. He says, I stand anchored in God before whom I stand naked, this God who tells me, you are my son, my beloved one. Mary, Elizabeth, and John Egan are living out their faith in ordinariness. Brendan Manning puts it this way, our ordinary self is an extraordinary self. A person who shivers in the cold of winter, sweats in the heat of summer, who wakes up unreconciled to the new day, who sits before stacks of pancakes and weaves through traffic and bangs around in the basement or shops and supermarkets or pulls up weeds and rakes up leaves, flies kites and listens to the sound of the rain on the rootfall. God desires to use that person. God desires to use you. Well, don't believe me? Then believe that angel that came and said, with God, Anything is possible. Let's bow in prayer. God, we give you thanks that the amazed and at the mystery and the wonder that you would come in the way you did in the form of a human being came in Jesus and showing yourself. Lord, for us to, to be able to call you uh, Father, to be one of your children, and at this Christmas time, may we, Father, experience you in a new way, more in a relational way, that sense of uh, Huga, uh, the comfort and coziness. Uh, God, we need that in this time of uh, year and the season that, it, that it's been. God, we give you thanks that uh, we can uh, call you Emmanuel, that you are God with us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Cries for order 
Everything inside me wants to hide Is this shadow an angel or a warrior? If God is pleased with me, why am I so terrified? Someone tell me I am only dreaming Somehow help me see Before my head agrees, my heart is on its knees. Holy is He, blessed am I, be born in me, be born in me, trembling heart. Somehow I believe that you chose me. I'll hold you in the beginning. You will hold me in the end. Every moment in the middle, make my heart your Bethlehem be born. This time we've waited for the promise All this time you waited for my arms Did you wrap yourself inside the unexpected So we might know that love would go that far Trembling heart, somehow I believe that you chose me. I'll hold you in the beginning, you will hold me in the end. Every moment in the middle, make your heart my Bethlehem be born. This is the time set aside for the prayers of the people. I don't have to tell you that COVID numbers are continuing to climb. The governor just extended the stay order until January 4th. But in reflection, I have to say that staying at home, working from home, has given me the opportunity to spend much more time with my grandkids. And I've made an observation that I cannot ignore. 
While they know about COVID and the pandemic, the one thing it has not done is dampen their Christmas spirit. Looking at Christmas through their eyes has opened mine. Gloria Stefan has a wonderful song entitled Christmas Through Your Eyes. And even in the midst of all of this, they still share in the excitement of the small events, baking cookies, decorating the Christmas tree, and lighting the Advent candles. We could learn from that. Advent season gives us the opportunity to look at our place, this moment, and each other through different eyes. Not only the eyes of children, but maybe the eyes of God. So this morning, that will be our prayer. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, teach us to open our hearts this morning as a child with wonder and anticipation of your mercy and grace. Cleanse us of our sin. Prepare us to enter your presence and stand in the gap for those who cannot. Open our ears to hear you clearly. Ease our burdens to place them in your care so that we may go forward and do the work that you have set for us to further your kingdom. As we pray this morning, we bring before you the leaders of our country and nation to see that you have instructed them to be good, of good moral character, leading the people for your glory and not their own. Pray for our local leaders who at this grassroots level make decisions that affect all of us. May they seek your wisdom. Pray for our church leaders, our teachers, our first responders, as they work day in and day out, caring for us. Bless them with what they need to do their jobs. Bless them with energy and perseverance as they battle this pandemic. And now, as we pray for this church body, for those who have passed on, we remember them. For their families, we ask for comfort as the holiday season approaches and their presence will be missed. And for those of us here, remind us that you use humble, ordinary people empowered by the Holy Spirit to change the world for the good news of Jesus Christ. In this we pray and we ask for ourselves. Keep us safe, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant.